Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be in Cape Town for the first time. So this is relatively new work, and I'm very excited to be presenting it because this project, as Karen said, is actually what brought me to Africa for the first time in 2003, um, to Busia. Um, and it was really, you know, I just wanted to get to the field and understand sort of what field work was all about, what randomized experiments were all about, and needless to say, sort of, I've been hooked ever since. So it's really exciting to be, to be here presenting this. Okay, so the question we're, we're interested in here is do child health investments increase adult living standards? And you know, why, why is this important? Why do we think understanding um, the long run impacts of child health is important? It has a lot to do with sort of this intergenerational transmission of poverty. You know, if we can improve child's health now improves into adulthood, then hopefully that will then impact their children and moving forward. And we think this, you know, this question is of great interest to JPOW researchers and of major policy importance for governments um, and aid donors. But, but unfortunately, it's a difficult, difficult question to answer, and answers have sort of remained somewhat elusive. And there's two main reasons for this, um, sort of two main methodological challenges. The first is that um, not of non-random child health investments. You know, sick children may have other disadvantages, so it's hard to really say because she was sick, this is what happened in her adulthood. Second, there's very few panel data that's tracking children into adulthood. It costs a lot of money to follow people over time, and so a lot of, uh, you know, it, it takes a long time to, to come up with this sort of evidence. So today I'm going to focus on the problem of worm infections in, in rural Kenya. One in four people are infected by intestinal worms around the globe with ma massive disease burden. It doesn't lead to high levels of mortality, but the level, levels of morbidity are extremely high. And when you look, if you actually look at um, sort of causes of disability just in life years, worms and other neglected tropical diseases are way up on the list. In our um, baseline sample of, of 30,000 primary school kids in, in Busia, the worm infection rates were around 90%. This is a huge problem. So I, I'm in a school of public health and, and lucky to have a, an expert there um, on worms as well, Peter Hotez. And so I've been learning a lot about um, the disease burden associated with, with worms. And it turns out that treating worm infections actually um, strengthens children's immune, immunological response to others. And so not only are you affecting the worm burden, but you're actually potentially having a huge impact on the, on the health burden in the country. So for example, there's, there's increasing evidence that deworming treatment can reduce the likelihood of malaria infection, right? And we all know that the huge cost of malaria in developing countries. There was a recent um, double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial in Nigeria that found that um, deworming treatment for 14 months decreased the prevalence of the malaria parasite. So we think that deworming not only affects your worm burden, but potentially has effects on all these other diseases, anemia, malaria in particular. There's also some new evidence out there that perhaps malaria, um, deworming may also have, have some influence on HIV. Um, there's a study going on in Kenya that if you get deworming medication when you're HIV infected, your CD4 count improves. Um, so we feel that the case of deworming in Kenya you know, illustrates the power of the analytical methods used by JCOP researchers and perhaps more importantly, their potential to improve policy, public policy choices in less, in less developed countries. So before moving on to, to this, this question that I'm ultimately interested in, I want to just quickly touch base on the original project and the work that um, Ted Miguel and Michael Kramer did. So the, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but just, just to give a little background. So the primary school deworming project took place between 98 and 2002 in Lucia, Kenya. Um, there were 75 primary schools with 30,000 children aged 6 to 18. And deworming treatment was phased in over three years in 25 schools at a time. So the, the program was designed in a randomized manner where the schools were phased in um, in a randomized order. So phase-in designs are something that are commonly used, particularly when there's financial constraints. Um, it allows not only you to evaluate, but also, um, you know, also fits with, with the financial constraints that you have. It's also important um, to mention that pilot programs themselves are often ideal testing grounds to um, test these new approaches before scaling up and before spending the money needed, needed for scale up. So as in medical trials, randomization provides a plausible method for estimating program impacts. Um, since on average, the treatment and control groups are similar in all ways but one, the intervention. Here's just a, a look at the original randomization. So group one schools, began receiving treatment in 1998, group two schools in 1999, and group three schools in 2001. And you can see that they're sort of randomly distributed throughout the Sia district. So the original work um, found that deworming led to large school engagements at low cost. Um, the treatment with albendazole and praziquantel twice per year cost less than 50 cents per, per child. 
They found that rates of serious worm infections fell by half. There were also significant gains in self-reported health and height. Um, Miguel and Kramer also found large gains in rates of school participation in the first two years of the project, with absenteeism falling by one quarter or 7.5 percentage points. So these were very substantial effects and extremely minimal cost. They also found that deworming had broader community-wide benefits. Um, not only was deworming improving the health of people receiving the treatment, but it was improving the health of the communities as a whole. It, it reduced infection among other community members um, in treatment schools, and there were positive spillover effects in school attendance. So when they take into account these, these positive spillovers, they find that deworming increased school participation by one year at a cost of only $3.50. So it's extremely cost effective. And Miguel and Kramer have argued that this finding provides a strong rationale for subsidized deworming treatment. So what I think has been sort of most exciting about, about this work is the extent to which it's actually been translated into policy changes. Um, you know, both Ted, Ted and Michael, I'm sure, would have loved to have been here today, but they've been disseminating these findings at the Ministry of Education, World Bank offices in Nairobi, WHO, USAID, and health policy conferences, and throughout meetings with policymakers in Kenya, um, as well as through popular news articles and books. So they've really helped sort of create this growing interest in mass school-based deworming, both in Kenya and now with deworm the world, they've treated over 3.6 million children. So the this sort of little pilot study in Lucia has really led to these sort of dramatic, dramatic policy changes, and that's kind of where we see um, where we see the, the, the ability of, of JPO. So just to let you see, deworming is also very um, simple. It's something that most people can be trained to do. It's not something you need a, a professional to do. And here's an example of, of the kids receiving their deworming treatment. Okay, so now on to what I, I'm really here to talk about is the long-run impacts on income. So following up on the primary school deworming project, we have the Kenya Life Panel Survey, which now cover, covers approximately 7,530 of the roughly 33,000 individuals for over 10 years. So this is a very long panel data set. But so by the time our final, our last round of, of data, not our final, but our last one, from 2007 to 2009, most were 20 to 26 years old. Um, we tracked the individuals throughout Kenya, and we also did international tracking, Uganda, Tanzania, and we were even lucky to interview one um, individual in London. And, you know, we've put a lot of effort into our tracking um, processes because we recognize that, that attrition is often a huge problem in these Canada data sets. So we have a tracking rate of 85%, which is a, a very high rate for a young adult population over a decade. These, these girls are transitioning from primary school into adulthood, moving a lot. Um, so we've been very happy that we've been able to, to be so successful in tracking them. This just gives a, a look at where where everyone has moved to. The way we, so you'll notice here that things are way over 100%, by indicating the portion of the sample that lived in each of these places for at least four months. So everyone obviously lived in Lucia at some point, and then you can see um, the distribution across. So what did we find in terms of deworming impacts on living standards, you know, 10, 10 years after the beginning of the program? The just so, one thing I should note is that in this case, we consider treatment, those groups in group one and group two, those that got deworming in 98 and 99, and we consider the, um, the control group, those that didn't get treatment until 2001. So the additional two to three years of deworming pills received by the treatment group led to large labor market benefits in 2007 to 2009. We find that among wage earners, income rose 20 to 27% in the treatment group, and it's significant at 99% confidence. And the gains are actually quite similar for females and males. Deworming beneficiaries appear to have greater capacity to work longer hours. Their hours work rose substantially and significantly by 12%. So it's an increase in hours of 5.2 from a base of 42.2. And we also see interesting shift in the employment sector with a tripling of employment in well-paid manufacturing jobs for men and much less casual labor and work in domestic services for women. Um, a few kind of interesting things going on here is that it, in, in doing some additional analysis, it looks like these gains in earnings are almost entirely driven by a shift in the sector, while the change in hours uh, is less explained by, by sectoral shifts and more about increased productivity within the within the, the same line of work. So this you know this evidence suggests that that health investments not only boost productivity and work capacity in existing capacities, but also potentially um, have the capacity to shift individuals into more lucrative economic activities. And this sort of question of kind of the structural transformation of the economy as a whole has been something that development economists have, have been interested in at the time. One thing I'm not gonna have time to talk about here is sort of 
selection issues into the wage earning group. We've now done a whole host of, of analysis based on selection, and we don't really find any differences um, in treatment and control in terms of who selects into wage earning. I should note, um, out of the entire sample, 17% are in wage earning jobs. So this, um, for those of you who like, who like figures, here's a look at the distribution of, of labor earnings in the last month. And you can see this very clear shift for the treatment group um, in terms of their, of their earnings. And you see a similar, um, a similar graph when we look at everyone who's worked since 2007. And then for hours, um, it's a little bit different, but you can see this clear shift at the bottom half of the distribution. You just don't see a lot of um, the treatment individuals with low, with low levels of hours. Um, so they seem to be working more and they seem to be making more, more money. So why is this happening? Why is something um, sort of as simple as, as deworming leading to these, these large labor market gains? So we find that um, deworming also led to improved measures, measures of health and education uh, in this time. So on average, the total times enrolled in school between 98 and 2008 rose by more than 0.3 years in the, in the deworming treatment group. We also found that if you look at a sort of aggregation of different measures of test scores, that they also improved. Um, Self-reported health status, which um, literature suggests is um, correlated with actual health status, is higher, as are total health expenditures. You know, one thing that we found is it's very difficult to sort of try and disentangle these, this health and education. You know, is it the health or is it the education that, that's driving these, these impacts? And ultimately, it seems to come down to it some combination of the two. Inter went back to the 99 data, because um, now that we've sort of seen that there's a potential malaria impact of deworming, we actually went back to the 1999 data and looked at the malaria data. And we find that self-reported malaria was 3.2 percentage points lower in the last week among the treatment group. So it does seem like there is something going on here with, with the deworming and, and malaria infection. We also find that the number of meals eaten the previous day increased significantly. So I got, the, I got the question at dinner last night, like, why is this, why, why are we even talking about this? Why is this even controversial? Of course, deworming is good. There's no sort of negative side effects. And so I was trying to make the point that, um, you know, obviously one of the reasons we need to experiment with these sort of things is to getting at the cost effectiveness. You know, if you ha only have so much money and you only can, can allocate it among so many interventions, you need to argue that your intervention is, is cost effective. So we did a, uh, an exercise to kind of figure out what is, what is our cost benefit ratio here. And we find it to be extraordinarily, that deworming has the return on deworming investment is extraordinarily high, even under conservative assumptions. So on the benefit side, we look at higher labor market earnings and wages in the deworming treatment group. And then for our costs, we look at the, the deworming pills and delivery, which costs about 59 cents per year. Um, the cost, the opportunity cost of time spent in school and not working. So these girls that are now in schools are not able to earn income for their families. And the cost of additional teacher salaries to maintain class size at pre-deworming levels. Going through this, this exercise, you find that the social benefit cost ratio is 37 to 1. And if we actually consider externalities, which the original Miguel and Kramer um, paper found to be strong, this would increase earnings gains by over 50%. Um, and we find an internal rate of return of 21% per annum. So just to show it, show it graphically what we did. Um, so this shows a huge benefit to cost ratio, making it seem like, like a worthwhile uh, investment. So kind of what is the bias? Um, Childhood deworming in Kenya not only improved school participation in the short run, but also led to much higher labor market earnings a full decade later. We are excited by this because it suggests that health investments for children that are above age zero to three can still have long impact, um, large impacts on future living standards. And while the income gains from, from treating worms cannot begin to eliminate the gap between Kenya and rich countries, the gains are meaningful for people living near subsistence. And so we're hopeful that the, the national primary just School um, program Kenya launched in 2009 will have have very large future social benefits. One thing I should just um, also mention is that our, you know, a similar um, evaluation was done in, in the U.S. by Fort Bleakley, and he found um, earnings increase of 24 percent. So we're finding things that are almost exactly the same as, as what he found, which sort of helps validate validate our findings. So, um, kind of, what are the next steps? Um, there's a lot of under, ongoing research projects in, in Kenya to help build a fuller understanding of, of human capital investments. There's a randomized evaluation underway to estimate the benefits of vouchers for vocational education. Um, and the thought is that this is a promising approach to skills upgrading about, among out of school youth. There's also a long run tracking for the Girls Merit Scholarship Program planned for next year. And we really hope that the sort of knowledge gains from, from these and, and other 
rigorous evaluations by the, by the JPL faculty here, staff, PhD students, will really help inform policymakers in Kenya and other African countries um, about the most effective education and, and health reforms. So thank you very much.